Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I must say I'm particularly happy to, to give a talk here in this, in this place. This is my university, where I've been working most of, most of the time, and especially on the invitation of François. And uh, so my attitude is a bit different from the positive talks that we, we already had and are going to have for the next two days. Um, bring people who bring new knowledge and solve problems. Uh, I'd be on the other side saying, uh, what's it exactly about? <coughs> and uh, are we actually solving problems that were posed? Is it also a claim that he's, he solved the problem about the, he said that this max, max thing. Yeah. <coughs> I must say I was not aware of the, of the problem. Okay, so <coughs> my, my attitude is to, to challenge, say, uh, will your technique be able to achieve this, well, of course, uh, a bit uh, complicated task. But before I, before I, I explain what I, what I think complicated, <coughs> I'd like to ask a few uh, preliminary questions. Uh, this workshop is about uh, how do you say it? University mm -hmm. in language and uh, uh, creativity. Well, creativity, okay, innovation, it's a sort of buzzword. Uh, <coughs> universality in language. Well, you know, for a Frenchman, it's a bit problematic because, so I, I don't know whether the thing will work. Uh, you don't see it very well, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the title page of a paper that was published in uh, 17-something uh, in Berlin. And it is called De l'universalité de la langue française. <laughs> so that for a Frenchman, universality in language reminds you of this uh, and the irony of the, of the thing is, of course, that it was commissioned by Germans. <laughs> because uh, because uh, Frederick uh, the Great uh, preferred speaking French instead of German. For a, 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 a number of reasons, among, among which uh, uh, Yes, okay. Uh, so the question is, uh, Language. Of course, the, your answer would be uh, university language doesn't mean university of a language. Although I strongly suspect that there is some sort of hint behind that. <coughs> the, second, the, the, the heart of the, the matter, of course, is that <coughs> it's said in English. And uh, a Frenchman never knows whether language means la langue or the langage, according to the distinction made by Saussure. So uh, I have to think a bit uh, what language means in university in language. Because as I said, I sort of suspect it's about universality of the language, <coughs> the only language, the English language. As, as a staunch nationalist, I sort of object to that. <laughs> okay, agreed. Agreed, it's not a language, it is the language, it is what Saussure calls le langage. Okay, that is the uh, typical human capacity of speaking. <clears throat> yes, okay. Then universality. Universality? What do you mean? Language, so understood is universal by definition. It is the capacity, the human capacity. So what do you mean by universality in language? Language is universal. Is there anything more to say? Yes, of course, if you read more carefully the <coughs> description of the, of the, of the workshop, <coughs> you read that it's a matter, it's, a, it's about discovering universal laws Universal means that there are universal laws, and that those universal laws will apply 
and will limit in some sense, will constrain, to use Francois's famous, favorite phrase, will constrain uh, creation of creativity. So that's the idea. Okay, fine. <coughs> yes, but then what's cre creativity means things that are created. Uh, things that are created are created uh, as texts in languages which are very different. And uh, <coughs> the, problem, or the problem is now that whether I mean, taking the point of view of universality will say something usable about those artifacts that are texts. And texts are complicated things. I remember, you remember that <coughs> the, the, the verb, the, the word text is actually a Latin word. It's the part participle of a texto textere textus, which means a texto is to weave. So a text is something that is woven. Okay. It's a, a complex, a complex artifact. Okay. And it is always not expressed in La langue, in, in the language, in language abstractly, is expressed in a given language. And at this point, there is, as you know, a <coughs> major divide about linguistics attitudes between universalists, who will say that all languages share a common structure, some generative grammar, or some common origin, and relativists, we say no. Languages are extremely varied, extremely different. And there is no observable, reasonable correlation between, well, I don't know, some <coughs> ending Abra uh, language and Chinese or something like that. I must say my attitude is rather on the relativist side, to tell you the truth. And I, that's the basis of my uh, skepticism about the possibility to really deal with actual texts with crossword techniques. Actual texts, <coughs> well, what do you mean by text? What do you mean by text? Of course, there is a, an important idea which I, I just mentioned because uh, Luc Stades has promised to deal with it in his talk on Friday afternoon. That is meaning. A text, and whatever is expressed in not a language, but in a language, must somehow carry some meaning. Somehow. So I'd be, I'm extremely, extremely vague about that. Uh, for the reason that my, the example I'm going to use is a, an example from poetry. And it's clear that the notion of meaning applied to poetic texts is something difficult to define. Uh, well, I'm not only a relativist, but uh, I would say I'm a poet. And so I'm a poetic oriented guy. And I have a feeling <coughs> that the normal way of, the standard way of the use of language is of poetic nature. That is, uh, the normal use of language is not to write mathematics. Writing mathematics is an extreme case, and I would even say degenerate. The normal use of language has strong well, say poetic sides, and uh, well, this this is being I mean, for for a long time, this was left aside from the uh, say <coughs> application of computer science to languages. But nowadays, it's it's becoming more on the front line since uh, uh, I think we will have a, 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 a talk tomorrow about detecting irony. <coughs> From the from from the tweets and, uh, and 
documents that you get are, uh, over the internet. So this means that the applications and the finance that goes with it, with them, are I mean, leaving the, the domain of the uh, let's say logical, logical tradition of mathematical like uh, mathematics like semantics. And so this is the idea that uh, basic use of language as something of poetry, I think, is getting uh, getting a place also in financial circles. Okay. <coughs> so what about what about poetic diction? Well, poetic diction is sort of uh, mysterious because it's you cannot really say you assign a meaning to a poetic text, but at the same time there are sort of local local meanings or impressions. Uh, I'd like just to, to take a, a couple of examples before I, I arrive to my scolded <coughs> uh, story. <coughs> In order to our Italian friends, my first example is Uh, <coughs> somebody you know very well, and I'm interested in the first verse. Passa la nevimia col madulio. Why and translate that into English? My boat passes uh, filled up with forgetfulness. It's simply extraordinary. And at the same time, I mean, it's, you, it, is, it, it has a sort of obviousness. Nobody will, will, will wonder about what it means. Well, the rest of the poem is a bit more complicated. If we have time, I'd like to ask our Italian friends how they, how they <coughs> They interpret that. Che la tempesta il film che abbia che abbia scherno. I must say I have some difficulty. But anyway, and I I I end there just to have a nice a nice a nice image. Uh, something I found on Wikipedia. That's the a, a page of one of the manuscripts of the Kinsaniere, and it's the first poem. It is Voi uh, Cascotati. Just to remind, to, to remind us that when we mean a text, we all agree that this is the text. Whereas it already is an abstract form of it. It's, it is a, a sort of conventional meaning. Because the reality, the reality is this sort of thing. And if you could, if you could see more clearly uh, the image, you'd see that this is not the voi uh, ascoltate che we all know. It's not written the same way. Okay, so there are a number of variations. But still, <coughs> we agree that there is this um, sort of abstract thing which we want to deal with. And of course, a, 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 one of the challenge, many challenges one could produce for François would be to apply the continuator-like technique to the cancellier. So you feed in a number of sonnets, and I think you, you can do the same with Shakespeare sonnets. I'm thinking of sonnets because, well, they are very well known. Well, the problem with my technique is that it's OK. Uh, mm -hmm. a, an aside for uh, since we're supposed to speak about linguistics here, a famous, uh, a famous example <coughs> about what, what's uh, possible and not possible. As you know, this Corliss Ideas Sleep Furiously was uh, produced by Chomsky as an example of an ungrammatical sentence. 
syntactically correct but meaningless. Okay? And uh, it, it, uh, it had a, a, an answer by Del Himes, who's less known than uh, less known than Chomsky. But Del Himes was a, a American linguist, a very nice guy, who is said to have been the last, last speaker of, I don't know what, dead language of the West Coast. And uh, <coughs> the opinion of Himes was, no, no, it's, it is perfectly acceptable sentence, and you can give a meaning to it by writing this. And your idea is not the brain, notions of color not yet color, of pure and touchless branching pallor of an invading in central green. Idea is now of incorrect color, less as the sleep sleeping in the brain, dormant, or mistaken to green, as if it does come the dreaming pallor. Into the face, as if this green had not seeping some of its pallor, see the wash of the brain emptying every sense of color. Okay, so this is from that ground. So again, so a, a possible a possible challenge for Francois would be okay. This this looks definitely like theme and variation. Okay? It's let's let's produce uh, themes like this one and you produce this as a variation. I think it's more for Pablo. <laughs> there, there is an Austrian, there is an Austrian uh, poet, uh, I, I think he died meanwhile, um, Ernst Jandl, who uh, wrote poems like this. Seriously. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so somewhat nonsensical poems, but... Uh, the, 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 whether it's nonsensical or not is another story. Anyway, what I, the well, this is supposed to be well, more or less an easy task. Uh, the thing I'm really interested in is something more, a bit more complicated. And let me try. I tell you the story. Okay, well, it's called scaldic, scaldic poetry, and it's. <coughs> It was uh, this poetry written in, well, written. It was written later. It was said, supposedly extemporized, uh, from the 9th century, and it's by Morris finished up in the 14th century in Iceland and in the Scandinavian countries in general. At, at, that, uh, at that time, you must bear in mind that Iceland <coughs> and Norway were very tightly were living together, so to say, uh, to the point that in the mid middle of the 13th century, the king of Norway formally took power over Iceland. So this, this is to be thought of as a, a really cultural unit of this. Well, this, this sort of poetry has a number of very interesting features, very remarkable features. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples uh, a bit later on, so you'll, you'll judge by yourself about the elaborateness of the structure. But there is a, <coughs> another phenomenon that could also uh, be, uh, give rise to a, a further sort of challenge, that is, uh, most of the extant uh, scaldic poetry is preserved in non-poetic writings, which are sagas. Sagas are prose things, okay, which tell a story, more or less complicated. And inside that story, every time and now, every, every uh, well, then and now, a character speaks. And he sang this. He sang because the, 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 the verb in <coughs> in um, in Iceland is kvad. But he sang this stroke, this stanza, and for various reasons. So to the point that um, it very very often looks like <coughs> that the saga 
was composed in order to hold together a collection of those uh, of those stanzas. As though a, it was a, a, a sort of frame in which to set the collection to, to show it off, to preserve it, and to give it some additional meaning. So it's, uh, it's, it's uh, the, the, the actual history of sagas is complicated. It's extremely enjoyable to read. Uh, and one, has, one gets the illusion that we are really in contact with the people who are described in the, in the text. <coughs> the problem is that those sagas were written between uh, 300, 200 and 300 years later. So it's, it's really a literary achievement and not a, a real thing. Okay, so um, uh, <clears throat> the, I think I'm, I'm going to, to show you uh, one good example and, and then we'll, we'll discuss about it. Okay. Can you read? Okay. So uh, this uh, <coughs> this is a a couple of stanzas due to uh, well yeah this man Theodor uh, this thing is th th Theodor. Arnolson. This gentleman happened to be a, the court poet of one of the most famous kings of Norway of the time, uh, Harald, Harald uh, Sigurdarsson, also called Harald Haradi. And he's the guy who was killed against King Harold of England at Stamford Bridge in 1966, I think, a few days before the Battle of Hastings. So he's a very particular, remarkable, a remarkable person. And um, the, the, the story uh, I'm interested in now is told, is told not in his, his own saga, by, in Hans Kingler. It is told in a secondary tale, the, the story of uh, Starkistic Hell. So I think I'm, I'm going to show you the text just to give you a feeling of what it looks like. So this is, this is the uh, a version of the Icelandic text. So here is the, here is the, how it looks, you see. This is how it looks. <coughs> well, uh, my Icelandic is not really very good. And I expect yours is even worse, but still, still, when you look at it, when you look at it, you really, uh, it's, it's, it's rather, uh, it's easy to, to, to see, because it very much looks like English. Um, uh, uh, see that when he said, let's, let, let's go back. I want to ask from Theodolf to say a visa on this. <coughs> and then Theodolf said, well, I'm called the head's called, and this, seem, this doesn't seem uh, uh, correct for me. And the, 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 the king answers, Svara answers, okay. Uh, there are more things in, in this that you can think. You are going to do the, your, your, your stanza and, um, and giving all these men an other, an, another situation as they are. You will say that one is Sigurd, Siegfried, the big hero, and the other is Fafnir, the, the, is, is antagonist. Okay? Okay, so it's if it's, well, I, I could even, if, he, if, I, if I had all means, 
give you a complex analysis of this. But then, then the thing changes. Then Theodolf, then he sang this stanza. And then what you get here is something completely different. It is no longer standard Icelandic. It is a sort of compact set which is impossible to analyze if you are not an expert. It's, it, it, it's, it's really, I mean, you had a, a comparatively I mean, simply minded syntax, okay, and then something starts. Okay? And that's, that is called the stanza. Okay, and then the thing goes on. That's exactly it. This is well done. Then, okay, <laughs> this is the king. Now, do do, do one another one, Adra, another one, okay, and then you'll one one of these, and then Thor, the god Thor, and the other Gaelic, which is a, a giant, okay, and go on, and took the other one. So you, you really have this very extraordinary, this is something that you do not realize when you read the translation. Because, of course, when it's translated, <coughs> the difference between the simple, the very simple, I mean, sagas are written in a very flat and cold and un, unadorned style. It is rectal to the Nothing. And then, all of a sudden, well, it's announced by that, took. There's something completely different. These are not songs. They're not supposed to be this. But they say, God, he sang. Uh, but look, he said, he sang. That's what it says. <laughs> that's what it says. <laughs> that's what it says. Okay, anyway, just to give you a, an idea of the actual situation. Okay. So now tell me that, that now let's let's have a look at it now. Make it a little bit more, more <coughs> understandable. Okay, so the the king and his retainers were going along the streets and they met in uh, in uh, what do you call that? in uh, in inn. And they were a, a cobbler or a, uh, a tanner who was uh, discussing and fighting with a smith, an iron smith. Okay? Two people abroad. And then the king says, <coughs> I want you, my skull, to extemporize a strophe on this. Then said, said the, the skull, well, it's below my dignity. How should I sing such uh, low-level people? To which the, the king answers, okay, there, are, there, are more to, there is most more to this than you think. You will sing, saying the one is not a, a, a tenor, the one is Sigur, the great hero, and the other is the dragon, the myth, so it, it, it raises <coughs> the whole story to the mythological plane. Okay. And then, adds the king, but at the same time, you will, you will have to name the actors by the name of their job. So it's a dual construct. You will have to write a, to write a strophe, a stanza, with uh, um, Sigurd and Fafnir as the main characters, while maintaining that the stanza deals with a cover and an iron. So the, the, that's, the, the, that's the constraint that's given to it. Okay. So um, how was <coughs> here is here is the the first the, the first one. This is not the same the same version for reasons I can explain to you. And what I want to show you there is something that is observable, even if you know uh, New Icelandic. <coughs> It is the metrical structure that's imposed on the stanza. The first thing that this is regular poetry. And therefore you have a certain structure. 
-hmm. And that structure is a bit complicated. Uh, you, you saw uh, presented on uh, eight lines. Actually, those eight lines are made up of twice four. And each four is made up of two halves. So this is another organization. Just to give you the basic structure, you have a what they call uh, the, the old Germanic rhyme. Well, the rhyme was at the initial of the strong beats of the measure. Sigurd Hegeli slang you, snack Lalibar Baka. Okay, S S S. And Skaf Kedishki Nashkeit. Skaf, Skaf, Skaf. Okay? And then Min Saust Om, Aru Inni, Illex. These are vowels. And then ends. Naturex, Anadri, Neflam, Konuta. So the basic structure is those star widers. Okay? That's one thing. Second thing, you have what they call half rhymes, that is uh, uh, echoes, short, sh short, uh, sh short, short, uh, short span echoes. Yeah, and yeah, the and in in the first half rhymes, n skinna, n n, and then you have uh, what? Oh, sorry, this this one, this one, I dropped. Sorry about that. It is N, Un, in this case. And here you have Ilvex, Kill You, sorry, and then Ever and Nadri. And in, in, in the blue things, in the blue things, you have the same consonant, not always the same vowel. N, In, N, Nadri. Okay, and here I said uh, it is N, In. Now, in the second halves, you have full assonance. Snack, brack. Hey, hey. Okay, and here, ilves, kill you. And lang, tanga. So this is the, the sort of <coughs> underlying structure of the, of the form. <coughs> it is strictly equivalent to having uh, 12 syllables in the French Alexandrine and and rhymes. It is exactly the same, the same type of structure. Okay, okay. The, you have the same for the second one there. Okay, now question, where is the meaning? Where is the meaning? Okay. <coughs> Well, the last thing we, we can see, <coughs> we said uh, Sigurd should appear. Yeah, Sigurd is here. Fine. Okay. What about what about Fafnir? No mention. In this, in the second version, in the second version, in the second version, we have. Uh, Thor and Gerard. Mm -hmm. Thor is here and Gerard here is here. Okay, so but we cannot make head of days of that. So do the process. So let me try and show you how these things can be elicited. Okay, the one is this is the five, so I think it's Okay, so this is this window is from the as you see some Nordic Grundfeld database. It's a database of Scaldic poetry. There is an international project for a full-scale edition of all all non Scaldic poetry, and. Uh, Fortunately for me, uh, this, uh, this example here is being edited online. Okay? So, uh, what may I? So, 
succeed in. I like to. Oh, that's the problem. Oh, yes. Okay, it works. Fine. Fine. Okay. Okay, so you, you recognize my text. Yeah. It's presented in the classical way over eight lines, where you have to realize that the assonances, the, the, the star line, is from the first line to the second. Which I, I, I don't know why they do, they do that's the way it's mm -hmm. traditional. Okay? <clears throat> as regards, as regards uh, giving a, an interpretation, mm -hmm. Well, let me show you. This is the interactive view. And there you can have every information we need about the vocabulary. Okay? So if you had forgotten your Icelandic dictionary, you need you get it there. Well, they, they won't explain to you the grammar more. But, now, something that's more impressive. Now look, this is, as you can see, this text here is given in verse order. That is, as it is written. And on the side you see a prose order. Aha. What does that mean? <coughs> this means that the whole text has been rewarded in a form, well, I wouldn't say it. <laughs> it's really obviously obvious, uh, obvious to understand, but it's, it, you may try to find some reasonable syntax in that. So there is a combinatorial transformation that using the same words, using the same words, makes some possible sense. Now what's the sense? What the sense? Uh, 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 well, this is not... So I go back to this version here because it will be easier to show. Okay, so this is what you have here is what you just get, you just got by the prose order. Okay? And additionally, additionally, they have put, I mean, braces to indicate the syntactic units. Okay? And from that, from that you can try to perform a direct translation. Okay, so uh, if you translate that directly, you obtain this. The Sigurd of the Sedge Hammer. <coughs> that's, that's what's written. The Sigurd of the Sedge Hammer is to be construed as, is, as indicating the Smith. Okay, so it is the Smith, and this interpretation is given to you in capitals here incited the strike of dangerous tanning tool. Well, the tanning tool is braca, is snag valigra braca. That's the snake of dangerous tanning tool, which is to be interpreted as the tanner, the other opponent. Okay? And the, sky, the scraping dragon of skins, scraping dragon of skins, which is this? Is it the Skavliki Skinna? Skreida or Lester Heidi? Well, I couldn't, I, I would like to, to, say, to say stupid things. Anyway, this is interpreted as this, slithered across the heath of the feet, that is the floor. Okay. And then people were afraid, people were afraid, this is, people were afraid of the arm is the snake. People were afraid, and you, you, you get this complicated interpretation. And globally, if you forget the whole of the complicated structure, this says 
that the Smith uh, taunted the tenor, the, the, the people, people were afraid of the, uh, the man with the, with the, with the, 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 the shoes who deals with uh, leather, but the men were, people were afraid of the tenor, okay, until the smith finally overcame the tenor. So the smith uh, attacked the tenor, and the tenor was vanquished by the smith. So that's actually the way the poet describe the, the brawl in the, in the inn using mythological figures and the oldest watch. So that's, that's, that's an example and well, I think I'm already near the end of my time. I, I stop here, just want to, as a conclusion, as a conclusion, I like to show this. Ah. My goodness. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. This is a, an opinion of a one of the main specialists of uh, Icelandic literature, professor in, who was it, in Birmingham, I think, and he speaks about the uh, verbal skill, verbal skill, and saying what a, 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 a skillful craftsman of verse, what else is a poet? And I, I suppose you will agree with me that what we've seen on the textual object is definitely analogous to this sort of design which comes from an 11th century Norwegian church owners. So when you mean skillful craftsman of verse, it is the same skill, the same craftsmanship as we see on this type of object. And this is what I wonder whether François is able to achieve. <laughs> this is the challenge, and this is my question. Thank you for your attention.